it seems to me that El Salvador has made one of the most brilliant moves of the century. Very curious to see where it is in 10 years as a result of this decision. I think El Salvador is still catching up in terms of its its grasp of Bitcoin. And that's what my, me, Primero Bitcoin, is working so hard to to close, to close that gap. Because it seems to me that it was sort of like, a, we're going to do this. And then everyone was like, okay, what is this? What are we doing? What's happening here? So it's also going to be proof, I think, that... You can you can put something together first, right? Uh, ask somebody to ride the bike and then put together the seat as you're riding it, or put together the chain as you're riding downhill or uphill or wherever you're going. I think El Salvador is way ahead of the game, and I think it's you know I think it's pissed the IMF off, but who cares? Bienvenidos al Ibex. Podcast número 36. Este es un episodio que estamos grabando con una nueva herramienta gracias a nuestro recording partner, Recording Box. Le tenemos mucho cariño. Hay un shout out haciendo que todo cada día eh, pues seamos de mejor calidad. Este episodio estoy yo solo. Eh, estamos con Robert, que está en South Carolina. So we're going to be switching to English. Um, and we're starting this podcast at the block height 746,047 of the only timeline that matters. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you for, for being here. Great to be here. I'm sad we couldn't make 747,000 exactly. We're on 47, but that's okay. We're going to make this work. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to this. So let, let's, let's start... Um, you know, let's start with the basics. Let's start. Uh, what's how you know who? What's your story? Um, what were you doing pre Bitcoin, and 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 how did you get to know Bitcoin? Yeah, so I always think about trying to open up my own story in a different way, but it always ends up in the same place. So the story is that uh, I. When I was young, I built a company that does interpreting services for the deaf and hard of hearing. And that company is still around. We work in the US, Canada, and the Middle East. And it's, it's very interesting because some of our clients are basically reliant on the petrodollar directly, right? We work with oil to some extent, even though we're doing interpreting services and directly some of our you know, revenue will come from oil. And so it's, it's interesting that Bitcoin is sort of the polar opposite of the foundation of the global economy. So it's interesting to have you know, swung from one part of the, the one viewpoint as it were to the other. I guess, where do I want to start with this? Uh, the moment I really, I really understood Bitcoin is also the moment I basically saw Bitcoin, which, which I think is kind of cool, kind of poetic. So to start, I heard about Bitcoin as I think everyone did the first time and laughed it off or thought it was ridiculous. Like it's very rare that you see it your first time and you get it. So somebody told me in 2011 about Bitcoin and said, it's never going to happen. Biggest mistake of my life. And then <laughs> I, uh, Heard about it again during the big bull run of 2017. You know, 2013 was not as mainstream. So 2017, Ethereum was an interesting thing. We were looking into Ethereum, all the other scam coins uh, that were that were blowing up at the time. And after everything uh, crashed, but Bitcoin remained around in 2018, I met Robert Breedlove at a conference who had been orange pilled recently himself. And we started to have a conversation about what Bitcoin really was. And it started to dawn on me. I would say that the moment I really, truly got a sense, a working sense of Bitcoin was actually from uh, a work of fiction. I'm trying to remember exactly what the work was, but, it, you know, what the title of it is. Uh, and I'm happy to send it to you after the fact so we can put it in the notes once I find it. But basically, it's a story that describes inflation. It was actually, actually, no, it's, it's, it was a scholarly piece that described a story about inflation. And it talked about Weimar Germany. So Weimar Germany printed a whole bunch of money to try to pay off debts. They didn't realize, they hadn't really thought through the economic implications of that. Some sympathy to them. It was the first time we'd ever experienced hyperinflation of that degree. But eventually everybody was bringing around wheelbarrows of money. And it also described in that same 
story or the same scholarly analysis of this story, a break, total breakdown of the culture. So as money inflates, culture also begins to inflate. Values are inflated. So if you would have otherwise had integrity, now you, you can't afford integrity because your, your money is worthless. You have no space to breathe. And generational wealth is the way to start to develop a, a lower time preference, a longer time horizon. So when I saw that, I realized all of a sudden, just very clearly, that was what clicked for me. So Bitcoin's 21 million, period, end of story. Can't change that. Rules, not rulers. Now we're, now we're talking. So I became very interested in pivoting into Bitcoin in some way, shape or form. So because of my experience with this company on deafness, I also have other experience building an education company, but that's another story. More or less, the a lot of the work that I did in that interpreting services company, even though I've you know historically been a sign language interpreter and managed interpreters, I was chief operations officially and still am. But what I'm really functionally doing most of my time is lobbying. I'm just speaking to people about you know advocating for those services, and that's a lot of the work that needs to be done. So that experience came over into what I what I do now uh, as a nonprofit initiative. The two things: one is uh, the Bitcoin Today Coalition, which advocates for pro Bitcoin regulatory policy, mostly in the you know right now in the United States, at both the state and federal levels. Yeah, it's great. It's great. It's great. It's a real privilege, and everybody is really, it's moving so fast. The dominoes are falling so fast. It's pretty unbelievable. And then the second is because of this experience with education I've had, I helped build the curriculum for my first Bitcoin, me putting my Bitcoin. And um, that's also been a really wonderful experience. And similarly, the dominoes on that side are falling. So the way I like to describe it is Bitcoin's only real immune system, only real defense is education. Period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It also happens to be the strongest immune system that you can have. Once something gets into your head and you get it, you can't get it back out. It's done. You're transformed. So education is the only thing you really need. So you don't you don't need a military, as it turns out. I didn't know that before Bitcoin, but as it turns out, in a way, having a military is nice, but you don't need it. So, so if education is the major tool for Bitcoin, then it makes sense that you would go top down. And then bottom up, you would try to do it both ways. So you would work with the federal legislator, le- legislatures and state legislatures to change policy, to incentivize miners, to um, put Bitcoin on balance sheets, uh, you know, reserve and on reserve and so on. And then uh, you would also want to do it bottom up. You would also want to educate students so that if you're a democracy, they're going to vote pro Bitcoin politicians in. And if it's not a democracy, they're going to take agency of their own savings. So either way, you win. But in one, you have a disproportionate impact um, on the law, which applies to everybody. And in the other, you have a disproportionate impact on the future. So that's sort of the, that's my personal strategy. And I'm finding that it turns out they, they all, they're all starting to cooperate organically, these organizations, because they both, they all see that the strategy makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I concur on that. And I want, you know, seeing how you, as an interpreter, you're in, in, in interpreting something, right? So you, 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 you take something, you communicate it so that it can be better understood. Um, as an educator, it's basically the same, in, in, a, in a very simplified way, the same principle. What do you think is the toughest thing to grasp on Bitcoin in, in, in your experience with the, with the different people you've talked? Is there like a common um, thing that you're seeing at the top as well as the bottom? Um, or, or, or is there something that unites? Is there a point? Because, you know, I come from advertising and, and I went into fintech and that's how I got into Bitcoin. But. I, I've always said like Bitcoin has a terrible PR <laughs> team behind it. It's just terrible um, because it and, and at the end is it, I, I deduce it that it's nobody can convince anybody. You 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 are your biggest enemy, right? You have to convince yourself. 
and and you and you have to go down that rabbit hole yourself and you have to push yourself which is something we're not that used to anymore um so so how do you you know what's like what's the point where you see that people are like ah, it's not worth it i'm not gonna push myself to go into the whole thing i don't know yeah that's hard i would say there's no one concept necessarily more difficult than the other anything that would be hard for people to get about bitcoin is probably hard because the vast majority of us are financially and economically illiterate i think that's the real answer and i don't think that's the fault of any person who's learning about bitcoin that's a systemic problem that has to do with education believing or educate curriculum developers in the world seeming to believe that knowing something that happened 2000 years ago is more important than knowing how to manage your budget today. That's not to say that I don't love tradition. I do. And that's not to say that I don't believe history should be taught. I absolutely do. I think it's taught poorly in general, but I would say that also it's very, very key not to forget that not everybody in the world has the immediate luxury of learning history. Some people should really learn the fundamentals first. Things like, I don't know, even how to clean, how to wash clothes. There are some people in the world who no longer know. I mean, that's a disaster. I don't know if you're ready to learn about history if you don't know how to wash your clothes. Let's just be real here. So there are just some fundamentals that have to be gotten out of the way. I think Bitcoin happens to be one of those fundamentals we haven't seen yet. So to try to answer maybe in a broader sense, what might be the hardest thing about Bitcoin, I think it's something that is very hard for most people in general, and that's vision, being able to put together or explain or understand a vision for a society, what we want it to look like five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years, 100 years. And if you're able to grasp the basics of Bitcoin, the hope is that you start to build a vision for what society could be in 50 years. And that also starts with getting a sense for what your own life could be in 10 years if you save money in Bitcoin. You just start there, right? One node in this whole societal system we've got going on. So I think that's that's hard. And that's also because we don't often exercise, as it were, the vision muscle. There's just something missing. We don't we don't apply thought in that direction. And that's a real shame. So I guess that's maybe not what I don't know if I don't know where to go with that, but that's kind of my instinct to answer your answer your question. No, well, yeah, I, I I get it. I mean, we're all most of the people are really in a survival mode. You're like, you know, trying to find your way, trying to find your path, and 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 um and and if you come down here to Latin America, it's it's you know quite some levels uh, uh more extreme the survival thing. I mean, you're really literally trying to you know pay a roof over your head pay the food uh, on your table. Um, and then somebody is trying to tell you like, look, you have to understand what money is and and and, and if we're really finding the whole thing and uh, time preference on, on your spending. And it's like, dude, I can't even eat, right? So, um, and I, I'm going into this because I, I would love to see or to hear your experience on creating the curriculum for um, or in helping create the curriculum for Mi Primer Bitcoin, how did that help you educating legislators? Is there a link there or what would be the link? Yeah, totally. The way the, way the curriculum is broadly ordered, I think follows our ideal roadmap for how we would we would like to educate somebody. Of course, everybody, you know, I just spoke to a friend about this that Bitcoin is very much an octopus and you can grab any one of its tentacles, any one of its arms and come into the same place, end up in the same place, the center. So there's really no right way, but the way we designed the program is more or less we open up with the problem, just like any pitch deck or VC or any way that you would want to explain something to somebody. If you had a breakup, you explain the problem and then you try to figure out the solution, right? So we just said, look, here are the six qualities of money. Here's what modern money has and doesn't have. Here's how that works. And then we went into thinking about the description of Bitcoin basically through the metaphor of a transaction. So 
there, right, there are two aspects of Bitcoin, right? The, the network and the asset. And so we can just gradually get to both if we look at the transaction. So start from a wallet, make your way all the way to the other wallet, the miners, the nodes in between, and describe each piece. So we simply don't, we don't do that for legislature, for legislators. Um, uh, it depends on their concern. So if, uh, if a legislator is a Democrat, they're probably going to ask us about mining and carbon emissions. So we don't want to start with money. We'd rather start with ESG. We'd rather start with why miners help stabilize the grid. If we start with the six properties of money, I think they would be very annoyed and they'd shut the door on us, you know? Yeah, I already so, know that. Yeah, 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 I don't have time for this. I'm asking about <laughs> carbon emissions, the climate change, the world is burning down. What's wrong with you? So, <laughs> so that's that's more or less where we we go. So I, I would say, you know, over and over again, all of us in Bitcoin, we see these two big attacks on Bitcoin, and there are always that Bitcoin is a criminal act or encourages criminals. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, yeah, criminals use it which is outrageous and um, silly and yeah, we're not going to get into that. And then the second is the ESG narrative, right? The mining narrative. So uh, we've been spending a lot of time assuaging people on that sentiment. I would say that one of the greatest things to discover is how enthusiastic, I mean, number one, places where you think people would not be enthusiastic about Bitcoin actually are. There are a lot of, it's, it's people get converted and then they start influencing their organization and we've done, we've done nothing. And then there are some places where we have done it and we started with a staff member and it percolated right up to the legislator and it changed how they vote. So this is a really interesting time. But that's, I mean, that's also the joy of Bitcoin, right? It's not, it's not as, it, in the same way that it's a decentralized phenomenon. It's also decentralized in its ways of being explained. Maybe all of life is like that, but particularly Bitcoin in my experience, it, I guess you could start the civil war or description of the American civil war or the El Salvadoran civil war in the middle of it, if you wanted kind of like a film, but you probably wouldn't, it probably wouldn't be as compelling. You would want to start from the beginning, give context and make it all the way through. But Bitcoin is just so nonlinear that. You can do whatever you want to attack it. Yeah, that's what's so great. What's what's the toolbox you're using for for or or you know the tools you're giving them um, to be able to, because it's a big deal. I mean, it's such it, it's so it has permeated so deeply that Bitcoin is wasting energy. And, and I mean, the whole, it's, it's, it's a big, it's a big deal. And then there's concepts that are very fixed into this. Um, like for example, in El Salvador, where you have, um, Bitcoin, Bukele and Chivo, and that's like, you have that triangle and, and what we're, I mean, Primera Bitcoin is doing what I'm really super proud and happy to see is how they're breaking that up. Right. They're saying, look, there's this thing, there's this thing, and then there's Bitcoin. No, let's dig into this. So. What are what what are you doing with with on on the on the yeah on the ESG side? What toolbox are you giving them to rip that concept open? We've we've had some. They're not one pagers. We call them one pagers. They're like three or four pages. They're very pretty with graphics. And sometimes we give them one of the biggest things that we pass around is a book called Bitcoin and the American Dream. It was written by the Bitcoin Today Coalition team. Highly recommended. Great book. So we pass copies of that around all the time. And that's a great toolbox. That's a great tool. Yeah, tool in the toolbox. But what I would say is the most important tool in any toolkit is relationship, communication. And that's what we give all the time. So you make a great first impression. They say, you're very cool. We want to get to know you or ask, you know, if you have any questions. Many of these staffers are overwhelmed. Living in DC is like drinking from a fire hose. So if you can do work for them by bringing them experts or answering questions, they don't want to be caught flat footed. So if you say, look, I don't need anything from you. I'm just happy to tell you about Bitcoin, give you answers, 
when somebody asks you a really difficult question, come to us. We'll answer the question for you. We'll make it all make sense. Everything is contextual. Here's a book. Enjoy. That, you know, the currency in DC is information. The foundation of information ultimately is trust. So the base, the base currency, ironically, in DC uh, is, I suppose, ironically, is trust. And, and that's very hard to find. And so when you come in and you slowly build relationships, um, ironically, by the way, because so many people distrust people in DC, right? So many citizens do. And so it turns out it's kind of funny that that's the, that's the currency. Anyway, yeah, I just had to, I just say that loud. I just say that loud. Yeah. So, um, so that, that, that's been a joy to build relationships and to get to know people and to, to give without needing to take. And people, people see that people sense that they take it very seriously. And then in the end, what do they get when they hear us out? They get resources, they get a win with their constituents, they bring in small business, they get reelected. Great. If you're pro Bitcoin and you get reelected, great. You're going to build institutional trust in the end. So everybody wins. That's really it. You know, and I actually, I feel like there's an allegory there. I feel like there's real life advice there, which is to say you can give somebody anything in the world, but if you don't have relationship trust, it's very hard to build anything else. So Bitcoin also does that, right? Builds legitimate trust between people. Yeah, man. I I love what you said about to give without needing to take, because I think that's one of the core things in, in, in Bitcoin, right? It's like, Bitcoin doesn't need any money. It's just going to be there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and so Satoshi, Satoshi was similarly mythical in that way, right? Yeah. He put all million Bitcoin in the network and kept it and he never resold it. So there's something, there's something about, something about that. That's very touching. Yeah. 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 I use, I, on an interview with uh, Vlad Kostov, and shout out to uh, BTC Takeover. I don't know if if, if you've heard of him. Uh, I do recommend you you check him out. He's awesome. Um, yeah, and um, he has his magazine and everything, and he used to write for Bitcoin Magazine. He has a cool story. And he describes, um, or he talks about Bitcoin as, or, or talks to the, that the main argument here is Bitcoin's immaculate conception. And I love it. And since then, I've I've been using it to to explain like Bitcoin's immaculate conception, and it's super important to use this type of words because literally that's what it is, right? The, that that gives it takes out that point of attack that you have in any other project, how it was conceived, and and it gives it that that value or that um, point that you brought out that I think it's very important that it gives without taking without needing to take. Um, and it's really up to you tying it up to what we were saying to understand it. And I think, how, how do you see that um, with the legislators? Because they're used to receiving because somebody wants something from them. I mean, that's how DC works, right? That's how lobbying works. It's like, I'm pushing because I want this. Um, uh, what what happens then, you know, that, yeah, one hand was, washes the other and all that. And then suddenly it's like, Ooh, dude, there's no hand there. It's just like me showing you his, uh, like, what's what's their reaction when they want to, do, do they, have you ever had anyone wanting to talk to Bitcoin CEO? There's no, I mean, legislators are all for sure cut from different cloths. No question about it. I think some are highly mathematical or technical and so they'll it'll be intuitive to them in that way this is a mathematical or a technical phenomenon period end of story i get it and then there are others who i think their inclination is to kind of look for who has outsized control of the thing as it were not necessarily a bitcoin ceo per se never never heard that or encountered that not yet anyway i'm sure there's a first somewhere but i haven't and I, I think their inclination, once they see that it's a truly decentralized system and that it's very hard to 
to break it. Um, they end up feeling a kind of concern. They're disconcerted by it. They don't like that the control is so limited. What do you do with something you can't control? You can't confiscate it. You can't this, you can't that. It's a little strange for someone whose whole job is to take control of things, put their, put their fingers on it somehow. So I think it's slowly dawning on people that this is just, this is like, I don't know, what's an unstoppable force, whatever that is. It's just that sort of thing. And you have to deal with it. It's like a rock coming down the mountain and you can either get out of its way or get on it, you know, whatever it is, but you can't stand in front of it. So I think, I think that's, that's been a really interesting transformation for people to go from a kind of concern or annoyance to gradual acceptance. And even some of the most vocal opponents of Bitcoin are now not speaking out. They're starting to realize that there's a legislative force behind Bitcoin, which is very surprising for many of us in a way, in a good way, and also very reassuring. Bitcoin is very quickly finding advocates. Part of the, one of the best arguments I think that's been made about Bitcoin as it relates to countries is that it's a geopolitical necessity. It's a question of national security. If you really care about your country and its welfare as compared to any other, say China or Russia or any other country that you might be having trouble with, the best thing you can do is store assets. And that will also, you know, in a way dissuade, like what will they get if they go to war with you? They're not going to find your Bitcoin. Um, so that's a, that's a plus. Yeah, it's a plus. So yeah. So the sooner people get on it, right. The sooner countries jump on the better. And we've seen that resonate. Okay. And, and then bringing it back to, to me, but my Bitcoin, um, how, you know, from your perspective and being involved in, 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 in my first Bitcoin, how do you think El Salvador is, is, is doing that? How do you, as a country, you know, do you, are you hopeful? Um, do you think they're, they're getting the right tool sets? Do you see light that they can actually, you know, build um, themselves into an important geopolitical uh, position? So this is my opinion. It doesn't reflect anybody else's opinion. I, it seems to me that El Salvador has made one of the most brilliant moves of the century. It's very interesting. And I'm very curious to see where it is in 10 years as a result of this decision. I think El Salvador is still catching up in terms of its, its grasp of Bitcoin. And that's what my, my premier Bitcoin is working so hard to, to close, to close that gap because it is, it was very, it seems to me that it was sort of like a, we're going to do this. And then everyone was like, okay, what is this? What are we doing? What's happening here? So to close that gap is, it's also going to be proof, I think, that you can, you can put something together first, right? Uh, ask somebody to ride the bike and then put together the seat as you're riding it or put together the chain as you're riding downhill or uphill or wherever you're going, you know? <laughs> which I think is pretty cool. So, but that's kind of, that's, that's the question. I, 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 yeah, I think El Salvador is way ahead of the game and I think it's, you know, I think it's pissed the IMF off, but who cares? So that's one. What do I think outside of that? I think that one of the things that I'm personally thinking about and always, always concerned about is knowledge integrity. That is to say, when you learn about Bitcoin, did you actually learn it or are you regurgitating facts? Do you actually understand how to apply, how to, how to engage with the network or, and your, and your assets as you collect or as you acquire, or, um, is it just sort of another throwaway piece of knowledge you'll forget the next time you're on TikTok or wherever you end up? So the, that's, that's really where I sit. The biggest concern for a country like El Salvador and really any country that decides to make Bitcoin a priority is how to properly scale an outstanding education on Bitcoin and financial literacy such that kids are broadly engaged. And that's a, a much deeper question, I think, than just Bitcoin, actually, because it, 
it comes down to how do people learn what they, you know, how do people learn period? What's the best way for them to learn? And then why just Bitcoin? Why not all aspects of your education, of your learning, of living, right? In order to, to really understand Bitcoin at this stage, before it's sort of broadly socially inevitable as a phenomenon, you need curiosity. You need to be able to recognize implications. Those things are teachable uh, or even discoverable. I think curiosity is something discovered, not necessarily taught. So, I, you know, we think a lot about that, how to put that together in this program so that the kids are excited when they walk out. They really understand. They want to learn more. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the coolest exercises in that, which I love, is where they um, first get to, they have to do barter and, you know, one has pen, they have to do that exercise and it's a mess. I mean, imagine that, that, that classroom with, you know, 14, 15 year olds trying to negotiate a pen for an eraser. Uh, that must be so cool. And then you, and then you put in the concept like, okay, now there's money and money gives you uh, an, an order. And I think, yeah, that, that really brings down the importance of money in our lives and it being the bedrock of society without a concept of money, which is really, you know, it's not natural. It doesn't, it doesn't exist in, 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 in outside of it's, it's a human construct. Right. Um, but that is what makes us able to build and, and create uh, long lasting relationships and, and, you know, achieve whatever we set our minds to really is money. But, the school system has totally forgot to, to, you know, put it into it and give it the importance. And in life in general, um, is gone in a. And I, I think it was correct at the time. I don't know. From uh, I wouldn't want to like get too deep into why we went to push out the education of money and the importance of money in our lives. But I think it came out of a. Of a, of a true concept because as everything in life it's a balance right like if you put too much importance to it you start tending to go to greed and and and, and power hungry in that in that sense and and that's a very very dangerous path to go to um i i also there's part of me that wonders if once upon a time everybody really understood what money was on an intuitive sense maybe they couldn't explain it to you but they just knew you can't trade a cow for 30 apples very easily but you can do something with a cow and if you want apples you can put some of the money you got from the cow and get the apples that that there's there was something intuitive about that in the same way that and in the same way that we've lost knowledge of how the ancients did battle like we actually don't know if they charged into each other as armies or if they stopped right at a line and they started to fight. We, we actually don't know because it was so inevitable. It was so intuitive and so obvious that no one ever bothered to write it down. But we've forgotten. We have no clue. <laughs> That's so, no one survived to write it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Or, yeah, right. Well, eventually everybody died for sure. So I, I think it's sort of like that. What ended up happening was money – became this thing that we we gave up to more and more centralized powers. And then it just became this kind of like being a fish in water. We just stopped questioning precisely what it was. We didn't engage in a kind of meaningful, you know, office culture doesn't actually build anything. Nothing is happening there. You take it and then you take a credit card and it's even worse. And you, you're just swiping. Like you actually have no idea what's going on. You have a number in your account and they have a number in their account or you have you have pennies but you understand that they actually don't mean anything like you can't save you can't melt down a penny or a quarter and then do something with that there's nothing in it so some somewhere along the way we disconnected we debased our money and then we also debased our knowledge of it along you know and then now nobody knows what's going on nobody has any idea <laughs> so it's something very funny about that yeah, yeah. You know, to, I, I love how you also mentioned in the beginning, you, uh, you're doing like a sandwich approach, right? And what we're discussing right now is the sandwich approach of understanding money, the importance of understanding the concept of money at the base. 
at the top you mentioned you go straight up to you know energy to to the biggest issues yes but what is your feeling of the understanding of money for legislators like where are they where, where do they stand do they stand like everybody of us that just didn't know anything and we have to relearn but they have more important decisions to take so that's why they focus on other stuff um i would say plenty of legislators have a have a working sense although because because we were all raised on um what's it called like modern monetary theory but there's a better term for it modern magic like magic money theory mmt <laughs> mmt <laughs> yeah print and it comes out that's what it is magic money theory <laughs> So because we're all raised on that and the idea that inflation is a great thing and so on, I think I think there are just certain disconnects that haven't been put together. That's really it. It's, it's sort of like the puzzle, the jigsaw puzzle hasn't been fully filled in. So once you fill in those last couple pieces, everything becomes very clear. Bitcoin makes total sense. But yeah, I think I think in general there's a working sense. They do work with it on the legislative level, so they, they have to approve budgets and they have to have a working sense of of an economy as it were. So I think I think I think the pro the broader problem is again systemic. What is an economy exactly? My personal thing is I don't think GDP is representative of an economy at all. I think in broadly speaking, an economy is the ability to pull something out of the earth and make goods with it. <laughs> that's that's sort of the That's it. Full stop. Right. Basically. And then everything on, on top of that is second layer, third layer. So when we start talking about services like lawyers, whatever, those are all constructs, quite literally. The law, we only need lawyers because we invented the law. Well, what's the law? Well, nobody knows anymore because a bunch of people wrote too many laws. And then why do we need CPAs? Well, there's tax law. Well, what's tax law? Well, nobody knows anymore. How do you do your taxes? I don't know. Somebody else will do it. So these are all just sort of third layer solutions that don't get at the heart of what an economy really does or what it really is. How much food do you produce? How much coal can you pull out of the ground? Whatever. How many? How much wood, lumber do you produce? Um, so, so I think I think in general the systemic issue is that we've actually forgotten what an economy is, how it works, and why we do the things we do. So if you're in a country like the United States. Actually, it does have a lot of, as it were, economic output, a lot of economic power, not just GDP, but not just in GDP terms or even, you know, not necessarily in GDP terms. But if you look at the raw goods that America produces, it's actually far less than its GDP would have you expect. So there's there is actually a systemic disconnect between how well, quote unquote, the American economy is doing and what's really happening on the ground, no pun intended, or in the ground. So I think that's something that not just legislators, but all of us have to reframe. And Bitcoin will do that in the same way that it's a new base layer for money. We're going to develop a new base layer understanding of, of what economics really is. And, you know, I'm also, we could talk about Marxism in a way. I mean, Marx likes to talk about how there's the economic base and then politics and culture, is, or culture and politics is built on top of this economic superstructure. There's economic base that there's that superstructure built. I, I think that's outrageous. I think it's wrong. Uh, I don't think economics is the end all be all, but it's critical. So that's that's all we can jump into any of that. But that's all sort of big picture how I would answer your question. Well, you know, because I mean, the the, the legislators are quite literally drunk on the Cantillon effect, and specifically, I think the, the U.S. ones because that's where the whole thing is coming out, right? So. Um, And they're very focused on, and, and you know, as a Latin American, as a, as a, as a Guatemalan, um, having also lived in Europe, I see certain differences. But the question I want to get to is, they're focusing on on local legislation, out of a, you know, privileged position of having the dollar to their to to their advantage, right? Um, so. On the future, I've, I've heard this theory where people say, in general, there is a an incentive for other economies like El Salvador, for example, that they dollarized. And Guatemala is the only Latin American country that hasn't suffered hyperinflation, literally. Like, is that true? 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is considered one of the five more stable currencies in the world, right? Um, so it is a, it, it is kind of a weird thing there going on. And, and if you ask me, and this I'm quoting here a, a very good friend of mine. Um, the only institution, the only Guatemalan institution that has done its job for better or for worse has been the Guatemalan Central Bank. And that is something when, when I've been in meetings with them, I always talk about um, and say, and like, oh, you guys are the great, because effectively we are the only Latin American um, economy without hyperinflation. But the question being to it is El Salvador just, they gave up, right? In 2001, they said, you know what, let's just dollarize and that's it. Puerto Rico did that further out in the 90s. Um, and more and more, it's just in a way make kind of sense, like, you know, let's just dollarize the whole thing. What I'm trying to go to is do the legislators today that you're talking to, do they understand the effect of the dollar on a global scale that could have? Is, is, do, do, do they think, OK, whatever I legislate here and now and in this aspect and specifically also the relationship between Bitcoin and the dollar, right? Will that have an impact on the global economy and how will it impact it? Are they thinking about that yet or do you, do you see any connection or what are your thoughts on that? I do not believe, but I can't be sure that that's a key conversation among legislators. It seems to me, and I believe, that among the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, that they do think about it. I think, I think our central bank thinks about it. I don't, I don't know if our legislators actively do, and they're not incentivized to, right? They're all elected locally, whatever local is. So whether it's by their, their state or their district, they are the people of their state rather, or the people of their district. They are always incentivized to think about what I can bring back to the constituents. And with very few exceptions, the concerns are, are rarely, I would say, international. Outside of things like concerns about maybe foes like China, Russia, Iran, Af you know, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, whatever it might be. Those are, those are concerns, of course, that people talk about, but that's only because American influence or interference is a question. But do they think about the economic aspect of what the dollar will do to other countries? I, I don't, I don't, I've never heard it brought up and I, whether they think about it or not, it, it's not really a, a point of conversation or a topic of conversation, which is unfortunate, right? Because this is what happens when you have a, an empire as it were, and you have uh, unwitting subjects because they dollarize or they hold dollar, the dollar or things are priced in the dollar. And then you're just not going to think about all of the countries that have a hard time because of that. Yeah. 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 No, and, and effectively, the, uh, the point being there is whatever, however, the U.S. decides to integrate this, to integrate Bitcoin into their legislation, that's going to have a global impact. Like, all Latin American countries are going to are seeing actually actively what the U.S. is doing on a regulatory side and how can they, um, you know, um, emulate that. Uh, in their own, in their local context. But, and I think there's, there's a big risk in that because the perspectives are very different, right? The perspective of, of, of a U.S. legislator is, as I said before, on a privileged side from, from having the U.S. dollar on our side. So you're seeing it more as a luxury good, right? And, and seeing more as a, um, maybe just going to the asset part and not to the Bitcoin, the network part. So on our side, we need Bitcoin, the network. We need, you know, right. that movement, the freedom of movement of, of, of capital between the silos that are our economies and um, for our counterparts in the, in the U S and my, anywhere to be able to send money to their um, families in a more, an amount ad hoc to the reality so that yeah. right now they have to you know save for a week or for two weeks and then they send that full amount but emergencies 
don't come up every two weeks, right? An emergency is an emergency and comes up whenever it is. It comes up. So you need to be able to send, you know, those $10, $15 worth of medicine um, in that moment. And I think that's putting the politics aside from, from El Salvador. I think that's the biggest achievement of Chivo, right? That you can actually send, if you go to a, a Chivo ATM, you put in a $5 bill and that instant is in the other, is in El Salvador for zero cost. Right. right? Right. It's like, that's a feat. Yeah. That's a feat, man. I mean, uh, I'll tell you, Western, like Western well, Union is, oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead, just quick. I was going to say, Western Union has not slept well since 2017. You know, whenever they really figured Bitcoin out, they just have not slept well. Let's start. Uh, keep, go ahead. Yeah. They haven't slept at all, man. They, they're, yeah. they're very on it. <laughs> they're very on it. I mean, um, there's a press release we just took out yesterday that, that will put context to that. Um, but where I was going towards is that, um, yeah, the, whatever, however the legislators see that has an effect here. And then let's, let's go back to the main topics. You, you know, ESG is like the, that's a big topic, right? So could you like say, what are the what is like your ideal scenario? How do you go into that legend and say, look, because of this, this, and this, and this, it is good for the grid. And having a contact with me, Primer Bitcoin, how could you link that to, for example, when I was Salvadorian legislators already understood it. <laughs> but let's say, let's say Guatemalans. I mean, they have a Bitcoin bond coming out. They totally understood the whole point. Um, but let's switch it around. How do you explain the Bitcoin bond to uh, a U.S. legislator? Do you do you do that? Is that in in in, in your tool set? No, not not really. No. No, the right now the concerns are much more big picture than Bitcoin bond or even you know we don't even really talk about Bitcoin ETFs. I mean, we're happy to, but we really don't. Um, yeah, no, no, you know, related products like that. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I guess I guess there we haven't talked much about Bitcoin's yield as it were at all over time. Because that's not that's while that's nice, the bigger points really are financial inclusion for the unbanked, no overdraft fees, total transparency, the ability to send money at any time. Um and again, yeah, this 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 notion that I mean, you, you know, it's funny. We say this all the time. Like everyone complains, miners are taking taking power. Well, okay, um, <laughs> the power is produced by the plant anyway. So you know, we just have to kind of explain. We have to explain the absolute fundamentals of power. So the question is, if if power is, if they have to produce, you know, X number of megawatts to run a city or whatever it might be, and then, um. Those are, that's just what you would produce during peak hours. Well, what's happening during non-peak hours? They still have to produce a certain, certain minimum, a certain floor in order for nothing to blow up, like go over, shut down. So when you have miners taking power during those hours, non-peak hours, you're actually stabilizing the grid. You're adjusting the grid and you're providing tremendous security. But you're also, you know, doing things that, we talk a lot about uh, trapping, trapping gases, trapping methane, for example, at oil rigs, oil fields. So they normally pump a whole bunch of noxious gases into the air because it costs too much money to trap it. But Bitcoin miners are happy to trap it and make money off of that. There's also electricity that's simply produced too far away from the source or you know can't get to where it wants to go. So Bitcoin miners will take that stranded electricity and do what they like with it. Um, so, you know, it, it, we explain it that way. And then we also go, we try, sometimes we go one step further and we say something like, think about how people heat their homes. Like we'll even give examples, like think about how people heat their homes and the fact that it would theoretically be possible to heat your home using a Bitcoin mining rig. And then now you're adding security to a network, you're making money, 
and you're heating your home, you're doing all three at once, you're reducing your electrical bill, like the cost of your bill to you personally. So, uh, you know, eventually we talk about how I, I like to think, I believe this will happen in the next few years, who knows, but I would like to believe that Bitcoin mining will eventually underpin every, virtually every industry that, that needs it or that, that could integrate it into its operations. Because why not? It's just cost cutting. It stabilizes budgets. It stabilizes grids. It stabilizes everything. So it's great. I don't know. Is that a good answer to your question? Is that helpful? Is there anything that you would yeah, yeah, add to that? Or, yeah, keep yeah, on, yeah. Keep on. Keep on that. I'm like, we're, that's we're, it. Yeah, let's yeah. go. It's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. I, that's I mean, it. That's, that's it. That's the basic, <laughs> that's the basic answer. Yeah. <laughs> And because, I mean, I'm sure you get all those comments on, you know, it consumes more energy than, 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 I don't know what country and this and that and on. I just, I recently saw a video of Jack Mallers was, was a, a snippet of it was very good where he explains, you know, since when is consuming energy a bad thing? Like you wash your clothes with a washing machine, uh, you fl fly to somewhere um, since, you know, in the part where energy is, the more we consume energy as a society, the more we will grow. Um, you're starting to hear now and, 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 and to see, you know, more talk about um, nuclear energy and like cheaper energy as well and all that. Yeah, um, that's actually the last thing I bring up, which is that mining is the we bring up. That mining is the only, not just the greatest, but the only source of innovation in energy because they're incentivized to get as big, a, as great a hash rate as possible for as little energy consumed as possible. So they're going to come up with all kinds of tricks to do it. New cooling mechanisms, new this, new that, but then actually go back horizontally, they go back into computing. So if you come up with a new cooling method for your servers, which is basically what mining is, just servers, then you've also solved a really big problem for companies, which is very wrought across the board because, you know, Netflix doesn't care about how much energy they consume per se. It's not their problem, but they, they consume a lot of energy. Video streaming is a disaster. If you want to talk about it on, if consuming is bad, which, you know, I agree with you. I don't necessarily think it is. <laughs> I don't think it is period. I like eating. I hope everyone likes eating. Consuming is good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So it, this is, this is what I think is so interesting about it, too, is the elegance of the incentives. So you just think about it. What other spaces could follow a similar kind of incentive alignment like mining and come up with a whole new way, you know, just allow the market to incentivize, you know, come up with whole new solutions naturally. So that's exciting, an exciting thought. So I guess I'll just leave it at that. That's, that's really what we talk about. I think a lot of people are moved by it. They find it compelling. And in the end, if miners really want to move to a place where energy is cheap, in order for you to say, I'm not interested, you also have to say, I'm not interested in giving thousands of jobs to my constituency. That's a very earthy, clear argument. And nobody wants to hear that. So there's that too. But I, I think just one last comment on this broadly, because I, I, like, I like the comment that you mentioned from Jack that there is this broad sentiment that humanity is bad. We've been bad and there needs to be fewer of us and we need to consume less. And I find that tragic. You know, I think that's the really simple point to make. It's a tragic thought. Not only, I mean, Elon talks a lot about, Elon Musk talks a lot about how we're very close to population collapse. That's one thing. And that's true. But it's also that, what's, I mean, what's the point of expanding a population as well if there's no joy? So in the end, this kind of fear-mongering, this sadness, this heaviness, it all comes back to there's just not enough joy being traded among people, if you will. And that's essential. And hopefully Bitcoin brings us closer to being able to find what is joyful in life. And that's not simply a question of input output. That's not a question of consuming per se. It's what happens in the midst of your consumption, right? It's how you process all of that. It's the joy, the trust, the relationship, the network building, the, um, the knowing that you have control over your life. 
those are great fundamentals that bring about a much more beautiful world. And that's not an economic argument. It just so happens that economics creates a fun, a nice baseline for that. So I hope we keep looking to that, that cultural goal as well. It's something that I think about a lot, how to create a kind of, not just abundance literally, but a feeling of abundance, which many people who have nothing have and which many people who have everything don't have. Word, yeah. my man. Yeah, Word. Yeah, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good one. That's that the other way to Love it. Yeah. Um, well, and I, and I think, you know, it can, we could keep on talking for hours. I, I have that feeling. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just to, to, to keep on, uh, to be, you know, start packing it in, like, um, do you, or, or from, Okay, I, wait, I have to, I have to be like, you've dropped so many things. I want to go to so many, but I have to like start uh, bringing it together. But, um, so I know how you're still, did I understand, right? You're still working at the uh, interpreter um, company and you're doing this on the side, right? So you're, you're pushing legislation, you're helping uh, Bitcoin initiatives, um, so, I mean, this, this were beautiful closing words, and I think you'll be able to tie it in. Um, what motivates you to, you know, do that extra push? I think it's, the, the answer was pretty much on what you brought in on, 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 on that button. Um, you know, to do that extra push to, to, to be active in Bitcoin and, and, you know, just educate because education takes time and and time is as limited as bitcoin so <laughs> why Maybe what's the reason more so. for, your, for, for yeah. that well your time i guess sure. <laughs> we're all gonna die yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure i let's just end on that because we're all gonna <laughs> die we'll just end on that that note uh <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good night, everybody. <laughs> why, why do I do that? Um, I mean, the hope the hope is you get to a place where you only do things you love. And I love doing this. That's it. I think if you were to look at my life, you would say something like probably 99% of his time was dedicated to education. So it's as you said at the beginning, you you saw something that I think almost nobody sees, which is to say interpreting in a way while it is translation between cultures, there is inevitably going to be some gap where you have to educate somebody on something. So it is in many ways a form of education. That's one. And then second is, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I think that really is the simplest answer is, is a, a love for, for how, how cool the how cool the idea is how how elegant it is how how much it has impacted my own life my own ability my own way of thinking the people who are in it are just awesome and i'm sure a lot of educators feel this way that seeing somebody kind of seeing somebody light up when they get something that's very cool and then I also think that while we live in a time that has so many indicators of cultural decay and difficulty, that's totally true. I also think we're in a time of incredible excitement. Love it. Love it, man. Once again, really, um, I feel we could keep on talking for hours. It's been a great episode. You you, you brought, um, I think, a lot of perspective. I, I, I really like it. And um, yeah, keep on doing what you're doing. That's, um, you know, in any way or possible form that you think we can help and, you know, we're there, please let us know. And, um, yeah, we're closing at, uh, block hide 746,052 of the only timeline that matters. Thank you for, um, listening to our podcast. Please subscribe, hit the like button. Um, you know, you can find us on spotify and all the podcasting platforms and uh please you know share your thoughts on our on the comments so um 
Thank you, Robin. Hopefully, uh, oh, I know, you know, Salvador, we're going to meet there in person. Looking forward to that, man.